Hello, I'm Robin Lane and I work for a charity called Christian Friends of Israel. We are the UK member of an international network that is linked to the Christian Friends of Israel Jerusalem office. In the UK we have exhibited at the Christian Resources exhibitions for some years now and I'm delighted to have this opportunity to talk about our efforts in seeking a clearer picture of Israel. We endeavour to help people see more clearly by first encouraging understanding among Christians in the UK, helping them to see Israel in context of the Bible, heritage, history and current affairs. Second, by challenging prejudice, working alongside the Jewish community to counter anti-Semitism, running or attending events like celebrations, Holocaust memorials and parliamentary lobby days. And third, by assisting community through humanitarian aid for needy causes in Israel, channeled mainly through the Jerusalem office. This includes support for Holocaust survivors, new Jewish immigrants experiencing poverty, and terror victims who are suffering loss and trauma. Why is a clearer picture needed? Well, there is a lot of misunderstanding and, sadly, false information about Israel. One light-hearted example is a recent article on a holiday website seeking to correct four misunderstandings about the land for potential tourists. It starts with a picture of a ski resort on Mount Hermon to correct the idea that Israel is full of deserts. But more seriously, Israel is a subject that arouses strong emotions and deeply divided opinions, even among Christians. That is largely because of the ongoing Arab-Israeli conflict, which has caused many deaths and injuries, much damage and suffering. So anyone who has friends or family who've been caught up in that suffering tends to align very strongly with one side or another in the conflict. Even when there is no direct connection to people caught up in the conflict, there can be very strong reactions to stories about Israel. A prime example was the report in May 2018 that a baby girl in Gaza had died from inhaling tear gas fired by Israeli troops during violent protests at the border. It resulted in much international condemnation of the Israelis and very few media organisations reported that two days later Gaza's health ministry withdrew the baby from the list of protest casualties. Apparently, having a congenital heart defect, she may have died of other causes. A reporter for the Irish Times was one of the few who wrote about that change in the reports from Gaza. The Guardian also covered it, but nine days after their original article criticising the Israelis. This tragic example reminds us that as well as the physical conflict, there is a propaganda war being waged. That is why we at Christian Friends of Israel endeavour to achieve a balanced view as well as a biblical view. But we also find that opinions are deeply divided over the biblical perspective on Israel, covering at least three different strands of thinking, replacement by the church, promises fulfilled by Christ, and restoration of Israel. Thus Israel is both a complicated and emotional subject that cannot be covered fully in one presentation. So I want to take just a brief look at five elements of this complex subject by way of introduction. First, the media portrayal of modern Israel. Second, a better balanced picture of Israel. Third, much good done by Israelis. Fourth, biblical prophecies fulfilled recently. And fifth, Israeli believers in Jesus. Let's start with the portrayal of modern Israel in the media. The Arab perspective is one of being invaded by Jewish colonialists from Europe, being forced out of land by military aggression and being oppressed in the land where many still live. A book on the origins and consequences of the 1967 war, published by Cambridge University Press, says they view themselves as innocent victims and Israel as an inherently aggressive expansionist state and outpost of Western imperialism. When appealing against unjust arrests or deaths, 
the Arabs claim that Israeli leaders abuse their power to conceal evidence and prevent any discussion of potential crimes. Such is the claim over the shooting of 32-year-old Ayed al-Halak in May this year. In February 2019, the United Nations Secretary General said nearly two million Palestinians in Gaza remain mired in increasing poverty and unemployment with limited access to adequate health, education, water and electricity. Many present this situation as Gaza being held under siege. One example is an article in The Economist which describes the imposition of quarantine in March 2020 as taking the area into a double lockdown. The Arabs claim their views are suppressed by a powerful Israeli lobby, reporting fatigue in journalists and fear of being accused of anti-Semitism. One correspondent said newspapers have been got at and persuaded and pressurised by the pro-Israel lobby. Time and space constraints are said to mean media reports neglect the contextual history of the conflict, including the number of Gazans registered as refugees, many of them coming from families who were forced to flee their homes after Israel's foundation in 1948. A former British consular official said, Gaza's complex and deep-rooted struggle has diminished the appetite of Western media. It is also said that journalists are terrified of putting a foot wrong and being accused of being anti-Semitic, so they dare not ask the necessary questions. The Israeli perspective is that the Arabs were the aggressors in the wars of 1948, 1967 and 1973 and continue that aggression today through ongoing terrorist attacks, such as the one in which a 62-year-old woman was stabbed near Tel Aviv in April this year. They believe that Palestinian national interests become before freedom of the press, to the extent that there is very little freedom of speech under the Palestinian Authority or Hamas. This problem was highlighted in 2018 by Human Rights Watch in a report titled Two Authorities, One Way, Zero Dissent. Israelis see little hope for peace when the Palestinian leaders systematically indoctrinate their children to hate Jews and accept martyrdom, then place them on the front lines of conflict ready for the cameras. This has become a major issue for donors recently. Several countries and the European Union have stopped their aid payments for education because of the content of Palestinian Authority textbooks. Terrorist groups among Arabs repeatedly use civilians as human shields, firing rockets from hospital grounds and schools, then leaving and hoping to gain video evidence of the Israeli response hitting innocent civilians. A recent example was the violent Gaza border protest in 2018, where whole families were encouraged to take part. Israelis think Palestinians adopt Western narratives of injustice to align themselves with history's archetypal victims, as in this article where they identify with Native Americans, quoting Theodore Roosevelt who wrote, The settler oust no one from the land. The truth is, the Indians never had any real title to the soil. They also think Palestinians stage distressing news scenes to bolster the widespread perception of them as innocent victims. The previous story about the death of an eight-month-old baby is just one example. Overall, the Israelis are convinced that Western media favours the Arab perspective and there is much evidence to support that view. In a parliamentary debate in 2017, Lord Grade, former chairman of the BBC, noted that on the 16th of June that year, three Palestinian terrorists, unprovoked, attacked Israeli police in Jerusalem with guns and knives, stabbing to death Sergeant Hadass Malka, aged 23. The BB's headline on its news website read, Three Palestinians killed after deadly stabbing in Jerusalem, putting the emphasis on the deaths of the terrorists. The BBC later accepted its mistake and changed the headline to 
Israeli policewoman stabbed to death in Jerusalem. Lord Grade said, I'm not accusing BBC journalists of anti-Semitism, but this example demonstrates the drip-drip effect of unqualified, uncontextualised singling out of Israel for criticism. Let's try to achieve a better balanced picture than the one portrayed in the media. From history, it is obvious that Arab nations were the aggressors in the wars of 1948 and 1973, and when we search more deeply, we find that they were also the aggressors in the build-up to the Six-Day War in 1967. They moved three armies to Israel's borders and blockaded the Straits of Tehran, cutting off most of Israel's oil supplies. Israel was forced to defend itself. Contrary to media claims, many Arabs were not forced from their homes in the first of those three wars, but left voluntarily, prompted by their leaders, who claimed that victory over Israel would be swift, and then the people could return to their homes. After Israel won that war of independence in 1949, the number of Jews who had to flee Arab lands was quite similar to the number of Arabs displaced from their homes, but most of the Jews integrated into Israeli society, whereas Arab refugees were kept in camps in neighbouring countries. Those who talk about a right of return for Arab people seem to ignore any possibility of a right of return for the Jewish refugees. Most discussion of any such right is totally one-sided. When it comes to the accusation of Gaza being under siege, it is important to know that the Israelis operate a major goods crossing with Gaza at Karem Shalom with complex safety measures to protect against terrorist attacks. That crossing can process between 850 and 1,000 truckloads a day, plus fuel. So Gaza is not under siege, but its neighbours, both Israel and Egypt, do seek to maintain careful control over the flow of people and goods. A primary reason for this emerged from the fighting in 2014, when Israel struck powerfully against Hamas and uncovered a total of 34 terrorist tunnels, one of which was three miles long. BBC news teams were given access to some of those tunnels and they were seen to be quite sophisticated, lined with concrete, some with electrical power and rails for moving loads. The dilemma for Israel is to decide how much of certain materials to allow into Gaza. The concrete supplied was intended for rebuilding civilian homes and facilities, not building terror tunnels. Terrorist attacks have been a major problem for many years now, including suicide bombings. Israel's much-criticised security barrier has produced a dramatic reduction in those attacks. During 34 months from September 2000 until completion of the first segment of the barrier at the end of July 2003, terrorists from Samaria carried out 73 attacks, killing 293 Israelis and wounding 1,950. During the following 42 months, to the end of 2006, there were only 12 attacks from Samaria, killing 64 people and wounding 445. While those numbers are still high, the barrier clearly caused a significant reduction in casualties, and Arab claims that it is intended to oppress them have to be seen in that light. Amnesty International has criticised the barrier for violating Israel's obligations under international humanitarian law. They are particularly critical of the route chosen for the barrier and the adverse impact on Arab communities. But the Israelis are clear that it is still needed because they have no real partner for peace, neither the Palestinian Authority nor Hamas. Both groups want to free all of Palestine from the Jordan River to the Mediterranean Sea. Consequently, there is no obvious solution to the conflict, and many people now recognise this. Some, however, refuse to acknowledge it, and Israel experiences a very heavy negative bias internationally, which can be seen in the statistics on United Nations resolutions. 
Israel is just one of 193 member states. But from 2012 to 2015, the United Nations General Assembly adopted 97 resolutions criticizing countries, 83 of which were against Israel. And from June 2006 through June 2016, the UN Human Rights Council adopted 135 resolutions criticizing countries, 68 of which were against Israel. That behavior is disproportionate in the extreme. However, this year, the situation has changed significantly with the signing of peace agreements between Israel and the United Arab Emirates and Bahrain on the 15th of September. These two countries have broken away from the previous Arab League policy, which was for its 22 member states to refuse recognition of Israel as a state until a deal had been reached with the Palestinians. These peace agreements are the result of many months of outreach by the Israelis. The hope is that other Arab countries will follow suit and break the long-running stalemate. Now let's consider the fact that since 1948, the Israelis have done much that is good. They have rescued tens of thousands of persecuted Jews from other countries and brought them to live in Israel. One early example involved 45,000 Ethiopian Jews who were flown to Israel in a complex operation named On Wings of Eagles. That involved around 380 separate flights in 1949 and 1950. In contrast to the accusations of apartheid that are thrown at them, they have kept important roles open to Israeli Arabs, who currently make up about 21% of the population. Some of them are members of Israel's parliament, some are judges, many work as doctors and nurses in the health service. An increasing number even serve in the defence forces, as shown in a BBC documentary in 2016. In terms of media bias, it's worth noting that the documentary was titled Israel's Arab Warriors rather than Israel's Arab Defenders thus reinforcing the image of Israel as an aggressive expansionist state. The documentary focused on Muslim Arabs, but it might surprise some to know that more Christian Arabs join the IDF than Muslims. Father Gabriel Nadaf is one of those who encourage Arab Christians to volunteer, saying, the state of Israel stands out as an island of sanity in the Middle East. Serving in the security forces is an honor rather than a duty. The Israelis have also maintained freedom of worship for all religions, which is quite remarkable given the hostility shown towards them. On the first Friday of Ramadan in 2019, around 180,000 Muslims went to the Al-Aqsa Mosque in Jerusalem to pray. Turning our attention to agriculture, Israelis have turned much barren land into productive land through hard work and investment. One example is the vineyards planted by Jakob Berg's family in Samaria, where the soil was described by experts as too rocky, and they had to drill through the surface layer to plant the vines. Drip irrigation is a major development that has enabled Israel's farmers to make best use of precious water in an arid land, more than half of which is the Negev Desert. This careful use of water has enabled the Israelis to slowly expand the fertile coastal plain to the south, making the Negev the world's only shrinking desert. Israelis have happily shown this drip irrigation technique to others in arid countries like South Africa, Kenya, Senegal, Benin and Niger. And they have worked hard to develop systems that now recycle nearly 90% of domestic wastewater. This makes Israelis world leaders in recycling more than four times the percentage of any other nation and providing 25% of their total water requirements. Through careful water management and the use of large desalination plants, the Israelis now have a national water surplus and export water to their neighbours in the disputed territories and in Jordan. 
Israel has implemented a policy of reforestation in contrast to the deforestation in many other countries. Since 1901, the Jewish National Fund has planted 250 million trees, covering more than 250,000 acres of land and transforming parts of the landscape. Israelis have also pioneered the use of natural methods of pest control on farms. Kibbutz Sadei Eliahu in the Jordan Valley has taken a lead in developing methods that include the encouragement of a local population of barn owls, mass breeding of insects that are natural enemies of pests, and breeding of bumblebees for pollination in greenhouses and open fields. The use of birds in pest control has prompted an international project, Birds Without Borders, that involves working with Palestinians and Jordanians to benefit farms all around the area. Israelis have also responded to the surprising fact that about one third of the food produced for human consumption globally is lost or wasted each year due to pest infestations and mold. Food technology consultant Professor Shlomo Navarro designed Grain Pro cocoons to provide a simple and cheap way for farmers to keep their grain fresh for market. The huge bags keep out both water and air and they're used in about 100 countries in Africa, Latin America, the Middle East and Asia. These are just a few examples of the good things that Israelis have achieved since 1948. There are many others too. 70 achievements during Israel's first 70 years are listed in our booklet published in 2018. They include USB memory sticks, miniaturization of mobile phones, the Waze sat-nav system, and the emergency bandage. Now let's consider some biblical prophecies that have been fulfilled. The Jews have endured centuries of dispersion and persecution, and yet continued as a distinct nation in accordance with words spoken by the prophet Jeremiah. Referring to the ordinances of the moon and stars for light by night, he quoted the Lord as saying, If these ordinances depart from before me, then the offspring of Israel also will cease from being a nation before me forever. The nation-state of Israel was reborn on the 14th of May 1948, which many people consider to be the fulfilment of Isaiah's prophecy. Who has heard of such a thing? Who has seen such things? Shall a land be born in one day? Shall a nation be born at once? For as soon as Zion travailed, she gave birth to her children. Isaiah also prophesied that the Jews would return from many countries. I will bring your offspring from the east and gather you from the west. I will tell the north, give them up, and tell the south, don't hold them back. Bring my sons from far away and my daughters from the ends of the earth. Earlier this year, the Jewish agency reported that in the last decade alone, Jews have returned to Israel from 150 different countries. And Jeremiah prophesied that the return would be greater than the exodus from Egypt. Behold, the days come that it will no more be said, as the Lord lives who brought up the children of Israel out of the land of Egypt, but, as the Lord lives who brought up the children of Israel from the land of the north and from all the countries where he had driven them. The return of the Jews to the land of Israel is reported to number more than 3,850,000 people, which substantially exceeds the numbers in the original exodus from Egypt. Isaiah also prophesied to Israel that the Lord would lift up his hand to the nations and lift up his banner to the peoples. They shall bring your sons in their bosom, and your daughters shall be carried on their shoulders. British and American planes were involved in the transporting of some Jewish refugees to Israel. Speaking through the prophet Amos, God said, I will bring my people back from captivity, and they will rebuild the ruined cities and inhabit them. And through the prophet Isaiah, they will rebuild the old ruins, they will raise up the former devastated places, 
They will repair the ruined cities that have been devastated for many generations. Jerusalem is the prime example of this. It was destroyed by the Babylonians and again by the Romans, but now it is rebuilt with a most unusual mixture of ancient and modern. Zephaniah prophesied specifically about Ashkelon. The coast will be for the remnant of the house of Judah. In the houses of Ashkelon they will lie down in the evening, for the Lord their God will visit them and restore them. Today, Ashkelon is a thriving Israeli city with a population of around 138,000 people. Isaiah also prophesied that the glory of Lebanon would come to the wilderness and the desert, which relates to the planting of so many trees by the Jewish National Fund. The wilderness and the dry land will be glad. The desert will rejoice and blossom like a rose. It will blossom abundantly and rejoice even with joy and singing. Lebanon's glory will be given to it, the excellence of Carmel and Sharon. The huge number of trees planted matches the glory of Lebanon coming to Israel. And wild flowers grow naturally when the rains come, even by the Dead Sea. But Israelis have also managed to grow flowers commercially in part of the Arava Desert, fulfilling Ayah's prophecy in another two ways. It was again Isaiah who prophesied that Israel would produce much fruit. In days to come, Jacob will take root, Israel will blossom and bud, they will fill the surface of the world with fruit. Exports of citrus fruit are reported to have peaked in the early 1980s at 1.8 million tonnes a year. The fact that the Jews would plant vineyards again on the mountains of Samaria was prophesied by Jeremiah, after he had prophesied the return to the land of Israel. Then again, it was Isaiah who prophesied that strangers will stand and feed your flocks, foreigners will work your fields and your vineyards. Describing his vineyard in Samaria, Yaakov Bird expressed surprise that volunteers from around the world wanted to come and help tend the vineyard and harvest the grapes free of charge. He considers this to be the biggest miracle God has granted them. These are just a few of the biblical prophecies fulfilled in recent decades with the return of the Jews to the land of Israel. But what about belief in Jesus among the Jews? As we seek to answer that question, we need to note that in the Hebrew language, Jesus' name is Yeshua, and that Jews who believe in him as their Messiah tend to refer to themselves as Messianic Jews, not as Christians. Well, there have been various estimates of the numbers who believe in Yeshua as their Messiah. A presentation published by the Jewish Voice organization in 2018 reviewed several surveys and concluded that the traditionally low estimates no longer hold true in the United States of America, and that as many as 11% of Jews there are now believers in Yeshua. That is 900,000 American Jews quite a contrast to the numbers of believers in Europe in the 19th and early 20th centuries. Focusing on Israel, accurate numbers are difficult to obtain because some groups worship in secret due to strong opposition from ultra-Orthodox Jews. But a study published in 1999 in Jerusalem reckoned that when the State of Israel was founded in 1948, there were just a handful of Israeli Jews who believed in Jesus as the Messiah. A wave of revival in the USA led to many new Jewish believers immigrating to Israel in the 1970s, giving the body of Messiah in the land a much needed boost. In 1989, Dr. Jim Sibley attempted a study of the community and personally counted 30 messianic congregations in the whole of Israel. In 1999, a second research study was carried out by two Danish Protestant believers who counted 81 messianic congregations and interviewed the leaders, 80% of whom had come from outside Israel. The total number of Jewish believers in the land was estimated as 5,000. 
By 2010, 10 years later, Christian Broadcasting Network reporter Julie Stahl estimated that the number had grown to 20,000. And a more recent study by the Israel College of the Bible in 2017 produced a conservative estimate of 30,000 Messianic Jews in Israel, worshipping in around 300 congregations. Thus the pattern is one of accelerating growth in numbers. Alongside these Messianic Jews, it's important to note that there are many Arab Christians too, around 138,000 at the end of 2019. Indeed, Israel is reckoned to be the only country in the Middle East where the number of Christians is increasing. The government defends freedom of worship, and that is highly valued by Christians when they see persecution in neighbouring countries. Turning back to the Messianic Jews in Israel, one thing that is easier to discern from a distance is the vibrant worship and praise that is developed into a regular part of activities. Barry and Batya Siegel are two of Israel's leading Messianic recording artists and have recorded seven albums together. One of the early ones is Shema Yisrael, Hear O Israel, released in 1994. Another veteran of Messianic praise is American Jew Paul Wilbur, who has led many concerts internationally, including several in Jerusalem. His first Jerusalem concert in 1995 produced the album titled Shalom Jerusalem. And there are now many others, like Sarah Lieberman and Joshua Aaron, whose songs are often available in YouTube videos. They gather with other singers and musicians to participate in praise concerts through the Messianic Jewish Alliance of Israel and the Fellowship of Israel-Related Ministries. Many Christian tourists are now invited to enjoy a Jerusalem praise experience. Looking on from a distance, the younger generation of Jewish believers in Yeshua seem to be more confident about sharing their faith with other Jews. Just one example is the ministry called One for Israel, which has reported a significant increase in the number of views of their YouTube videos during the coronavirus restrictions. Their recent series of 12 videos has been particularly successful. One by one, it refutes sayings from Judaism's oral law by quoting relevant passages from the written law in what we call the Old Testament. So while some Bible scholars claim that the Jews need to accept Jesus as Messiah before they are entitled to be restored to the land of Israel, all the evidence is that God has taken them back to the land and is granting increasing numbers of them faith in his son now that they are there. So, to sum up, the overall situation in and around Israel is complicated and this presentation has only touched on a few aspects of it. In general, Jews and Arabs have opposite views on the portrayal of Israel in the media, but there is much evidence that the portrayal is overly negative. A better balanced view acknowledges the military aggression of the Arab nations and the ongoing aggression in the form of terrorist attacks, yielding a more favorable view of Israel. Israel is rightly criticized for some of its behavior, but its situation amid hostile neighbors is an extraordinarily difficult one, and it is much easier for people to criticize Israel than criticize the Palestinian Authority or Hamas. There are many examples of Israelis doing good since 1948 and sharing the blessings they have received with other countries. In the light of the number of biblical prophecies that have been fulfilled in Israel since 1948, and the rapidly increasing number of Jews coming to faith in Jesus as their Messiah, we believe that it is very important for Christians to seek a clearer picture of Israel. <laughs>